go ahead and um, get started, everybody. Hello, good morning. My name is Thomas Galvez. I am a member of the VTC committee and co-host of this workshop. Saigon South International School is honored to be hosting the ninth annual uh, Vietnam Tech Conference in collaboration with Eunice Hanoi. It is also my honor on behalf of the VTC committee to introduce you to Max Eisel and Rob Rockcliffe, who will talk to us about connecting software systems for school growth, engagement, and retention in the upcoming workshop. Uh, Max is the Director of International Sales at Final Sight. Max enjoys working and meeting with schools around the, year, around the world. For the past 10 years, he has worked in consulting, training, and project management for education technology companies, including management information systems, online learning platforms, and communication platforms. Uh, Rob has always been interested in technology, and after seeing the Apple Mac and how it changed the printing industry, he dove deeper into technology. Educated in the UK with a printing degree, he moved to the USA and started working in a private middle school in Pomfret, uh, Connecticut. He then moved to an independent high school where he managed the Windows and Apple servers, taught digital photography, and managed the school website, which was hosted by Final Sight. Eight years ago, he joined the Final Sight team first in support, moving through the integration team to his current role of sales engineer slash solutions analyst. On a daily basis, you can find Rob working with the Final Sight team, as well as clients to help maximize their use of the Final Sight CMS and how it integrates with other systems. So everybody, please welcome Max and Rob. Take it away. Thank you. Let me just hit the share screen button, make sure I'm on the right page. There we go. So uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so. Today, it's going to be uh, kind of bittersweet for me. I mean, two years ago, I was there. Uh, we had just done a successful final site university uh, and then followed up that I, I presented at in person at the conference. But uh, I'm sure just like many other people, um, everything's been remote for the past 15 months or so. But uh, it's really good to be here. I'm happy to uh, to be joining uh, and, and presenting. Um, and so Obviously, uh, you, you've already got the intro. That's me. Uh, it's also my email and my LinkedIn uh, information. And we'll have this again at the end and some time for questions. But it's always good to, if, if you want to get connected, you have both my information and, and, and Rob's information to follow up afterwards. But so really what we're, what we're presenting on today, um, and <clears throat> it's going to be kind of a back and forth between between Rob and I today, but also if you have questions uh, or anything like that, please jump in um, by you know putting something in the chat. Uh, Rob's monitoring that while I run the slides, and we'll be able to uh, answer your questions um, and and as we go along, and there'll also be time at the end for questions. Um, so, so the key topics of today is really using your website to drive community engagement. Um, obviously, that, that's become even more critical now when uh, most of the schools become digital or virtual campuses and those kinds of things. Then also working with your systems and, and having them all work together through integrations and, and um, making sure the whole thing's connected. New tools and technology for school, those will go through and, 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 and those things, especially how a lot of the tools that we may have traditionally used have been transformed. Um, and a lot of the things have, have, have been forced to become a pivot uh, overnight. And then obviously, um, which will only continue to grow is the importance of security and privacy. So those are the topics that we're covering today. Um, Rob, you know, obviously we've done these together before, so jump in whenever. Um, but then um, as we go through, so kind of starting out, as I mentioned, using the website for community engagement. And really, <clears throat> with the world becoming uh, much more virtual, uh, and, and this was even before pandemics and, and those kinds of things, obviously what you have is a situation where your website really has become your storefront. Uh, it's the first impression, and in some ways, it's even the impression before the first impression with whether you're ever found in search, um, and then what, what's that like once um, once someone does find you and, and those things. And in the end, 
Um, Enrollment Management Association, obviously this is the source for that. Um, and for all these things, we, we have put links in to the slides that I'm sure uh, we'll, you'll be able to have available through the app and those kinds of things. But um, I don't think it surprises anyone. The number one reason or the number one factor in a parent's decision, whether to apply to your school or apply to a school or, or a program or anything like that is the website. Um, and, and with that, the design of your website is key. The design of your website is critical. In, in, in all pieces. Um, and, and really, when it comes to the benefits of design, you have these six key factors. Um, first, you're trying to build trust. And this isn't just for recruiting and attracting uh, uh, families. This is also for keeping them and um, keeping them enrolled, but then also at making their lives easier and which in then turn makes every teacher and every administrator in the school's life easier. Uh, and that's really building trust, confidence, um, being able to find things, increased engagement, uh, whether that's through your open houses um, and, and all the other pieces. And then is it fully responsive? I mean, I don't think it surprises anyone that a majority of the traffic to websites comes from a mobile device. Um, and, and that's only going to continue to increase. Um, and I would say that we're getting closer and closer to the three out of four web visits are coming from a mobile device. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, go ahead, please. I, I was going to say, and I think what we have seen um, as a company over this last year has just been... Um, the schools that have been able to communicate effectively with yeah. their parents have had so much more success. Um, my local school district have had a, a terrible time getting their message out and saying, this is the plan. And, and there's a number of reasons for that. But I will say that the local private school um, that is in our area has seen a huge growth because right from the get-go, they were able to put a plan in place and put it on their website and say, this is what we're doing for our students and to keep everybody safe. And so that really instilled that trust and, and just help people know exactly what they were doing. So, you know, when you've got that ability to say, you know, these people are leading me and they know what they're doing, that is just so invaluable. And, and the, the schools that have done that the greatest have really benefited uh, in this last year from that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's just become more and more critical uh, you know, and I think a lot of these factors, right, are, are in, 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 in that. Can I easily find information? How easy is it? Um, is it logical? Uh, and, and is it accessible uh, for, you know, d different, uh, different people and, and, and those pieces? And then mm -hmm. one piece here is this emotional connection. Uh, and, and, and really, people make decisions based on that. And, and I think sometimes... It, it's it's a lot easier to get someone to uh, react or or act in a way or click on a call to action and those kinds of things, um, you know. And and when you show instead of tell, so it's always about the visuals rather than 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 the text and 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 those kinds of things. When it comes to design trends, I mean, I think uh, the kind of the key piece here is that. Um, uh, over the past few years, I mean, most websites will open up to what's called a hero banner, where you have the big banner at the top. It's either a video or, or, or an engaging photo, high resolution, big photo. But now it's also, how can you now take that and, and also be different? Um, can, can you, can, can you uh, use that hero in a way that's, that's beyond what, what you see from everyone else? And Things like immersive motion, um, where you feel like you're you're part of it. It's almost like a um, virtual, you know, a VR setup and those things. Vibrant colors. Um, you know, I think uh, I would say five, six years ago, the trend. And, and Rob, you're, you're more with the printing side of it, but so you can you can tell me if I'm wrong. But it, it seemed like four or five years ago, everyone was trending towards black and white, and and then you would do a pop of something in there. Now it's more big, vibrant, and, and you use the black and white as a contrast uh, in a much smaller way. Mm. Um, and, yeah, the and those kinds of things. Yeah. Monochrome was huge. Yeah, absolutely. 
and and so now it's like big color big vibrant pieces and and really uh not being afraid of that in in those ways and then <clears throat> you know one of the big things is is that um uh, it, it's just gotten so much cheaper for digital photography when you know when your your average mobile phone has a better camera than the best digital camera six years ago and, and so really there's no excuse not to have rich visual detailed photography that you know and and that's really uh, yeah follows this all these other pieces and then the big piece here that that i think often is is sometimes overlooked is what is the overall goal uh, you know, w w what's the message you're trying to convey with your website? What's what are you trying to recruit students? Are you trying to recruit faculty? Are you trying to communicate with your current families? What's you know, what what is the goal or, or your many goals? And really, the design should drive that trend. And, and that goal driven design as well. That is, is so very important when it comes to the next slide, which is user experience. Um, why are people going to these searching on Google, why are they trying to find information from your website? Yep. And when they're going there, what are they seeing? Are they getting a good landing page or are they getting a page that you have completely forgotten about um, and not paid any attention to? So those kind of things definitely come into play as well. Um, and, and I'm, I'm going to talk about a little bit, you know, Max is playing the positive guy here. I'm going to talk yep. a little bit about things not to do on your website. Um, Google are also going to be bringing in a different algorithm this year um, that really penalizes slow loading pages. And so if you've got a slow loading page, uh, studies have found that it's actually, it causes stress in people. So if the, the quicker you can get a page loading, the better mm -hmm. that is. And then things like pop-ups, broken pages, um, you know, buttons that don't work and images not loading, all those kind of things, it may not seem like much, but if you are a user coming to a website and something like that doesn't work or gives you an uneasy feeling, sometimes that's all you really need to be put off at school. And so you want to make sure that everything with your website and everything from that first impression is very smooth and it's positive. Yeah, and it, exactly. And, and, and when you, when you want to think about how do I have a positive user experience, I always go back to the practical. And, and what would you want from a, if a family was coming to your school in person and they walked into your front door, what's the experience you want them to have? And if you think about what's, what we find too many schools will do in, for example, their admissions section, you click on their admissions section and the first thing it tells you is what the fees are. And it's on an old PDF and, and, and it's a really kind of a clunky uh, experience. Well, that if you were to say the same thing from an in-person experience, it's basically you're saying a person walks in the front door and wants to know about the school. And the first thing you do is you hand them a dirty old copy of the fees page and that's it. And, and, and that's the experience. And so, you know, the user experience should be the exact same experience that you would want to have someone have in person, um, except it's an online experience. You know, and I think in the end, uh, when it's become that much more important, I think, as a result of COVID-19 is parents want technology. They want technology that makes teaching easier. They want technology that, make, that, that makes learning easier. When it comes to virtual, you know, what do you want to do when it comes to virtual? Sorry, I'm just having to let some people in. There we go. Uh, and, 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 and obviously, it adds flexibility. Students can can do things that uh, online that that would be much more like they were there in person. It it um, you get there earlier. All the different pieces, uh, and and again, it, it's more options. Mm -hmm. And I I think this is really this year has definitely raised some questions uh, in regards to this virtual piece because now I've seen where schools are really talking about, well, what if you were sick and you can't come back to school? Do we want to have that virtual option to just help some of these families? You know, this is not something that's going away. It may may not be there um, as we've had it this year, but I think for some people having that virtual option is going to be a really, really useful tool, um, not only to get uh, 
people that are having visa problems from other countries, but just, you know, sick or, you know, traveling or, or, or sick families or whatever. Um, so there's so many different things that you can do. Mm-hmm. And why not use those dollars and, and, and you know, make use of, of those students? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the way you kind of transform your campus into a digital campus is a combination of the online experience, also the mobile online experience, whether it's through an app or whether it's through a, uh, um, a, uh, a, a very good responsive um, uh, website, you know, things like virtual graduations, uh, distance learning hubs, all these different kinds of things are, are, are key pieces to really transforming your school into a digital campus in addition to a bricks and mortar campus. You know, things like portals where you can have uh, community spaces that are behind a password uh, or passwords and, and, and it's very personalized and, and you're able to have a very direct line of communication and, and, and those kinds of things. Online staff directories and um, content filtering and, and, and all these kinds of things are, are some of the technologies that, that make that that much easier. But it's also going to contribute to that user experience and that it makes it that much easier to find things. And, and this has really been the key um, that people have focused on this year, because you want to have a central location. And if that's for your parents, that's great. If it's for your alumni, that's great as well. Uh, and the whole idea is to keep your community engaged. And Mm -hmm. so how often do you search for something on Google and then you get a communication or you get a bit of information that is not necessarily at the right place? Um, Maybe you're getting it from social media. You click on that social media and then social media's main job is to give you the ads from their ad providers. And so all of a sudden, you've gone from looking up the admissions of a school to looking at these knives or something for some reason, because you've just gone down this rabbit hole and Facebook have engineered this specifically. So everybody is competing for your eyes. And if you can keep people on your website and keep reinforcing your communication and reinforcing your brand and everything like that people are not going to be distracted they're not going to end up somewhere else it really is just about keeping that communication going um, and keeping people engaged and feeling like they're in the right place you know and it's really also one of those things about making it a reason for your families to go to the website you know if, Mm -hmm. if, if the information is never updated if there's never anything new and it and, and never changes, then there's really no reason for the families to go to the website. But in, in cases when there's someone who's maintaining the information, you're posting news. And, and I think it's also kind of integrating all the different pieces and, and we'll get the integrations here next, but really also in this idea is why are you putting things on Facebook when you could be putting that on the website and then you could post something on Facebook, but then link to the website with all the information. And so then rather than having to go to Facebook for something, I have to go to Instagram to see those photos. I have to go to YouTube to watch that video. I have to wait for the email for that. And all the different pieces is having one digital hub for all your information. And I think on those same lines, I think a lot of that, and and Rob, I'm really going to let you lead this part, is really the idea of the systems integration and, and all those kinds of things. And I think uh, the, the photo we see in front of us here <laughs> is something that we're all very, very, very familiar with in the past uh, year at least. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and the whole idea behind data integration is really just to make your life easier. I mean, it is we're asked for so many forms nowadays and we capture that information and how many of our schools are actually going in and adding information through different places in the cycle. Um, You know, we really, in the perfect world, that data should work for us. We should be capturing that at a very early level and then that should be flowing with us right through our journey and it shouldn't stop once we've graduated it needs to keep going and we need to keep in communication with everybody so that we can build networks and we can help people out and we can make sure that those people are really set up to go out into the real world and and they can get communication and they've got a network and things like that you know there's so
some of these Ivy schools um, in the, the United States, they're, they're, they're good and people are successful just because of the networks that they're coming from and the people they know. So, you know, all our international schools really should be doing that kind of outreach. Uh, and if we capture all that data, that data is really, really valuable. And so not only can it save you time, um, it, it's going to also energize you and, and give you more data points so that you can make decisions like, you know, how many people come through your school that enjoy doing a specific sport and and you know can you do um can you do fundraising based on that particular sport so there's lots of different sure. things that you can cal can can pull in um and the whole idea behind an integration is just to make sure that that data pulls through correctly to each system um, and you don't have to keep doing extra entry and things like that and, and making sure that your data is correct. Having trust in the data, um, like it says here, is just the main thing. You have to trust your data. It has to be correct. Um, and, and just having that um, in there is great. And, and the best thing about um, the time we're living in now is I think people are realizing that. And so there are so many different ways of um, having communication and what we call a federated services, meaning that you log into one system and then you can bounce to each multiple system without putting your credentials in again. So having federated services, um, you know, usually the, the protocol they use is called SAML, um, mm -hmm. but you know, it's Google offer it, uh, Microsoft Teams offer it, other companies do offer it. Um, so definitely if that's something that you're interested in, um, definitely start to ask and inquire about that because that will save you a huge amount of time and it will also encourage and help your parents when they're logging in. To, to different systems. Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and when it comes to the integrations, and, and I think, Rob, could you, could you talk a little bit about the difference of what's the difference between an integration and single sign-on and, and how they're a little bit similar, but also a little bit different? Because I think too often the terms integrations and single sign-on are used together, and that almost begins to turn into a, a are they the same thing? or, you know, and, and, and that piece. So I, if you could just kind of talk a little bit about what, what's a data integration versus what's a single sign on. Absolutely. So in, in our world, my world, um, the, we refer to the data integration as we're pulling information from that system. And mm -hmm. in, in our part, we don't want to become the main database. We just want to reflect what you have in your database so that it's on the website or people can view what they need to. The SSO is really how we pass people back into a system. So if you have logged into Final Site and you have used your school's Active Directory or you know a Google login or something like that, where can I get to now I've got those credentials in? You don't want to have to enter credentials three or four times. If I'm dropping into Ravenna or if I'm going to Magnus or something like that or right. Vijigami, those credentials are already there. I, the system trusts each other. And so you can then click on a Vijigami link. You will get dropped into there. You can see your kids' images and pictures, um, and then you can share them out or do whatever you want to from there. So um, yeah, integrations is we're pulling data. SSOs, we're really dropping people into other systems. Perfect, perfect. And I just put in the chat piece. If you have questions, please just, just post them as you go along. and and. Rob and I are kind of watching those as we go um, and, and, and those pieces. And, and here, here's, for example, a diagram of how that whole system works. If you want to talk people kind of through this a little bit, Rob. Yeah. So um, your SIS system, obviously, like we said before, you're probably going to capture a lot of that data in your admissions pro process. And nowadays, you know, back in the olden days, it used to be everything was paper, somebody would type in that manually, and then you would have your records from there. But nowadays, you've got the parents, the students, they're filling that data out. So you're already getting really good data that's accurate from those students and parents. So from there, your admissions then goes over to your main SIS system. Um, and you can then start to assign grades and um, information systems and grading books and things like that. Um, and, and where constituent manager really comes in and the final site website is if you have that central location, you can have people logging in. And so for students that usually 
um, comes in the form of their Active Directory. So they use uh, login credentials to get into their network at the school, and then they can use those same credentials to log into our Final Site website. And then from there, they're going to go over to a section of the website where they have everything they will need for their day to day. They're going to get calendars, they're going to get portals, they're going to get newsletters, they're going to get updates, they're going to get athletic schedules. Whatever you think they need, you have the ability to build that. And so it's really great to have that central location, like we said before. And then the other thing that's an extra layer on top of that is based on their groups, we can start to filter out different information for different groups. So right. if I am living on a certain dorm, I can have content from that dorm show up in that portal. So right. no longer is it static content and you've got to manage this all manually. You can right. have a lot of this information flowing in um, dynamically and updating dynamically. So that kind of thing is really great. Um, and then the directories, obviously you're keeping your faculty directory up to date. So that means when a parent comes to a directory and wants to communicate with the teacher, they've already got that information right there. So again, it's reducing that frustration, it's allowing that communication channel. And if they've got concerns, you're responding to parent concerns and they feel better and, and the school is trusted. And it's just that reinforcement time over time. Um, and then we can also, because we've got the data for the students and the parents in our system, we can then start to create mailing lists. Um, mm -hmm. And we can create mailing lists with different things, athletics data, newsletters, you know, things like that. We can send them up. And again, it's just that updating keeping people in the loop. When activities are coming up, you can send it out so the whole family can attend or whatever they need to. Uh, and then on top of that, to make your life easier, uh, we've created something called workflows. Um, and that is really tied into messages in that it allows us then to say, okay, I'm gonna send this message out Yep. And if somebody responds in a certain way to this message, I want to send them another message. If they don't respond to that message, let's send them this other message again and see if they respond a third time. And so it really takes some of that work that you used to have to do in the admissions funnel where you would say, okay, here's my folder for this person. Can you send them this note or can you send them a brochure? And it does a lot of that for you. So once we've yeah. got that data in our system, it really opens up a whole world of communication communication and just increases that trust and just allows you to to have better open communication and more transparency. Absolutely. You know, we just had a question about, you know, can students subscribe to specific news feeds and and absolutely. I mean, and and it's not just students, it's also parents, it's also teachers, it's also uh, alumni and or outside visitors, depending on, on where we're talking about, you can absolutely have people subscribing to certain news feeds. They can have they can subscribe and have alerts even where they get an SMS text message and or an email message about something uh, when it comes to those kinds of things. So absolutely. And, and, and uh, you can do a lot of different you know pieces with that and i think one of the things that we're going to talk about is really the idea of the these workflows and what it comes down to with that is it it really turns into a much more streamlined process so when you send out 100 emails and 60 people open it and 40 don't what's going to happen with the 60 people who open it they get message a and the 40 people who didn't open it get message b the of the 60 people who opened it and clicked on the link, they get message A1 and the other people get A2, whereas everyone gets a message B if they didn't open it. And, and it, all that happens automatically. And, and rather than having to monitor and, and filter and do all these different things with those 100 emails, you can constantly do all those. Um, you know, other pieces, I mean, for example, um, Woods Academy is a school that used workflows. Uh, and what they have done is that they use it for 275 plus prospective families. And they had to basically set up workflows, have that integration where they're pulling that from their admission system. When they get an inquiry, they automatically go in. And after that, it, it becomes an automated process. Um, so rather than having to maintain folders and emails and all these other things, all this stuff is churning and happening uh, and they're pulling the data and they're able to focus on the actual admissions process rather than the, the paperwork side of it and those kinds of things. Same thing when it comes to online forms, 
super easy. Basically, if you're sending home any piece of paper to be filled out and sent back, it can be replaced with an online form. Uh, and, and when it comes to that, what's also good is you can also pay, tie in your payment gateways so that when there's after school activities that people are signing up for and they want to do, uh, you want to have an activity fee, that can be automatically added in and all the different pieces. Um, and I think, Sorry, Max, yeah, go I'm just going to yeah, yeah, jump please. in there real quick. Um, I was going to say, and the, the thing to remember about forms as well is it doesn't matter which form um, program you use, keep mm -hmm. your forms simple. The longer the forms are, the less chance somebody is going to fill that out. So put the bare minimum that you can in a form just to make sure that people will go through yep. and that, that inclination they have to fill out a form and do it, you're not going to take any excuse for them to say, you know what, this is too much or whatever. So um, yeah, the, the rule for forms, keep them simple, keep them easy. Yeah. I mean, I, I always say this, I, I say, can you fill it out while I'm stopped at one traffic light? And, and the reason for that isn't because people are sitting in their cars filling out forms. It's really to give you kind of an idea about a time thing. And, and again, people, it's, a, it's a fast, busy world and, and people are, are constantly. And when people are constantly on their phones, the last thing you want to do is a long form. So mm -hmm. what is the information you need? You need a name, you need an email, you need a phone number. Other than that, you can get that once you get them to commit to at least submitting that information to you. Because yep. the worst thing to have is someone fill out three pieces of information, get frustrated with how much other information you want, and clicking out of it. Yeah, and, and definitely test, you know, the, the mobile optimization there. We can't yep. say enough about that. You know, 60% of your traffic is mobile. Make sure your form looks good on a mobile device. 60 and growing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and integrating other systems, for example, in this case, we're talking about like open apply with admissions and tying that whole system in together and, and, and really taking your admissions workflow. Here's, for example, a superstar in, in the admissions game, uh, Saigon South's own um, Katie, who uh, hosted us, as I said, uh, two years ago. And, and if you have questions on how to really successfully integrate the whole system in together, she's a great person to actually use as a reference in this and because we've actually done a case study with them, uh, with the school about how that whole process works and, and, and you see kind of some of the numbers and ideas and how that whole thing works together. And, and probably something you're going to hear and uh, much more of um, is really create once, publish everywhere. This idea of I create a piece of content and I'm able to use it in multiple ways. So for example, I create a piece of content for the website, but I also share it through social media. I also share it through the e-newsletter. I also use it in my next marketing email. I also use it uh, in, in a uh, push out to the mobile app and all these different ways. But the key is I create it one time and use it in all these different locations. See, there's a question that just came in. I got it. Preparing interviews, I think here, it, 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 could you have automatic sign up for times and update in real time? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's definitely ways that you can set up forms uh, for RSVPs. You can set them up for wait list. You can, uh, uh, and appointment scheduling. And this isn't just a final site thing. There, there are other ways to do that and, 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 and those pieces. We're just kind of, you know, talking about what it looks like from the, our lens. Um, but yeah, there's definitely ways to do that. Um, and again, when, when you have a piece of content that you push it out to the different social media channels. And then also, again, I, I can't say enough about, you know, using your own version of clickbait when it comes to Facebook. You know, it drives me crazy when I see that a school posts all 50 photos from the costume parade on Facebook. No, you take one great photo and then a link to the website because you want to drive traffic from Facebook to your website. That's going to help you with search engine optimization. That's going to help you in search and all these other pieces because Jeff, I mean, uh, Mark Zuckerberg does not need your help getting people to go to Facebook. You should be using him and his company to get more traffic to your website. And, and, and so the same kind of thing, you post one photo on the Facebook group with a link to the website so that they come to you.
Mm -hmm. And I, I will say, you know, your website, the pages that you use, they are a di direct competitor with Facebook. So don't think that they are helping you. You yeah. need to use <laughs> them for your own devices. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook is, is, use it to push to the website. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then a mobile app. And, and this is, I mean, obviously for the past two, three, four years, uh, it, it's been kind of a move away from mobile apps to, well, it's a responsive website. We can just have them, you know, uh, page uh, bookmark a page on, on, on their phones. We're seeing a bigger trend back towards the mobile app in the, in the sense that there's so much more functionality kind of types of things that, you know, the idea that you can push directly to the phone and, and, and all the pieces. And so we're building more and more mobile apps now than, than we have been. And I would say, Rob, wouldn't you say in the last 15 months, we've probably built more than, than the last four years combined? Yeah, I was going to say, we, yeah, definitely. Um, and I think that piece is really the app allows you to have more personalized communication um, because you can also, um, you're not just managing your website, you're getting that content from your website on the phone. And then um, there will be other um, communication options, but this is great for, you know, news and calendars and things like that. It's all right there um, in your user's hands. So this is like a portal um, that is right there in an app. So that's why it's been so valuable, I think, is all this data is really just condensed into one small app and you don't have to kind of dig around and, and find the navigation and things like that. So I think that's why we've been seeing such uh, an explosion in, in the apps. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think kind of the next piece here and the last kind of topic that we're really going to cover is the idea about privacy and security. And I think every day we're hearing about you know different uh, different attacks and 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 all those kinds of things. And just in our own experience, I mean, this is 2020. This this is what we experienced, and 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 as a company, when we work with schools. This is what we deal with, uh, and, and and you know, Rob and I can can go into a lot of details, but in the end, I think one of the biggest things is that th there's so much misinformation as well about what's happening out there, and 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 all those kinds of things. But in the end, I mean, we dealt with four million different daily suspicious request attacks made against schools um, in, in 2020, um, and and Rob, so you want to talk a little bit about data? security and privacy yeah i was going to say the, the fbi came out earlier this year and said you know they're really expecting an uptick in the attacks on schools because some of these ransomwares that have gone on um they're actually making money from them you know so i think um that is going to see an increase um so so basically yeah yeah you know you've got data um when you've got high target people like you know famous people, rich people um, that are going to your school, that definitely puts a larger target on your back than if you don't. So having um, trained staff, having good security, having industry standard um, uh, policies in place can really help you to keep control of your data, make sure it's not leaked, all your backups are good, um, all that kind of thing, and all the final site employees, we do go through uh, training. We do have to have these certified. We get tests in our email to make sure that we are not clicking on links that we don't. And so I think that's one thing that schools could definitely improve upon is just the education of the teachers. You know, are you clicking on the correct links? And if you're suspicious of something, you don't click on it. You send it to somebody, you have somebody else look at that, but just, you know, randomly clicking on links anymore is just such a dangerous, dangerous activity. So, um, you know, the, the, the uh, security is really as good as your weakest link. And I can't stress that enough. So, um, Absolutely. We, t we, you know, because we are now looking at so much more data and trying to integrate with all these different systems, um, the privacy is really, really huge. And so that's part of the reason we did partner with Google and, and have all the encryption that Google use um, just to allow us to do the DDoS mitigation with Cloudflare and things like that, because that gives us an extra layer of potential protection so that we know our data is secure and they're not going to get in from our side. 
you know, I think a key thing here is also this last piece about GDPR compliance, because, you know, we know GDPR is an EU rule, but one of the interesting things is that GDPR actually has uh, governance outside of the EU in the sense that it follows its citizens. So if you have EU citizens, for example, at your school in Vietnam, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that the, that data protection follows the citizen, not the location of your server or whatever else you want to call it. So that's something to keep in mind. But it's also the thing with GDPR is that the privacy rules there aren't just the law or whatever, but in the end, they're also the right thing to do in the sense that you should be protecting the privacy and, and identity and all this information. And a lot of times I, I ask schools to take a step back and ask the question of why do you need that data in that situation? You know, why is that something that you need to upload? Why is that something that you, you know, what, what is, what is it you're using it for and all those other pieces? So in the end, uh, I think that's also sometimes having that conversation about how are we using the data as much as, you know, how are we protecting it? I think one of the key things to also keep in mind is when it comes to open source is that, Who's monitoring that at your school? So, you know, in the end, I mean, if you're using an open source like a WordPress or something like that for the website, you know, who's going to be monitoring that? Who's going to be doing the security updates? Who's going to continually be doing the updates for all of this? Because it is an ever changing and constantly being updated and, 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 and those kinds of things. I mean, uh, yeah. And I will say, you know, open source WordPress it, it's a fantastic platform. It really is. Absolutely. And I think it, it goes with any other um, program that you may use for your website, you know, Weebly, Wix, any of those, um, you really get what you pay for. So if you are not paying for something or you've got a plugin that was free, you need to make sure that you didn't have, uh, it wasn't created by a university student for a project and that was three years ago and they've not updated it because now they've got a job. Um, it's better to pay for something and know that you've got some recourse behind it um, mm -hmm. than it is to get something free and thinking you're saving some money because um, some of these WordPress attacks are very, very simple in nature, but it's just because um, the necessary thing has not been patched because nobody has really used it in a while or kept up to it. So, um, you know, Absolutely. with anything that you use, just make sure that you are getting um, a good service and, and you've got something that you can go back to and say, you know, is this updated? Have I got a hole in this? What's it, what's it like, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously some of these here that, that, that are WordPress, I, the reason for that is I want to kind of point out the dates here are all within the last two months. Um, but the reason I post that is, is that, that that's just one example. I mean, and what Rob says is that, you know, obviously there's so many other pieces that, that um, can, can fail when it comes to these. But in the end, it's always good to, to uh, monitor these things and, and make sure it's not your weak point. So uh, as Rob mentioned, I mean, final site runs through the Google Cloud uh, and, 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 and those pieces. And so do you want to talk a little bit about why we made that choice? Yeah, so we had, we're, we're originally um, hosting out of a company in Boston. And obviously with the global infrastructure that we had, um, we just wanted something a little bit more robust, um, a little bit better encryption and, and Google do a fantastic job. Obviously they're a worldwide company and they have to abide by all the rules uh, for all those companies. And so for all those countries, sorry. So Google Cloud and us being a global company, it really was a kind of a natural progression um, with their data knowledge and things like that. Um, we partnered with them. We've now got our service hosted with them. Um, our uptime since we launched in March has been 99.98%, um, which there was a little blip, which was a Cloudflare uh, issue, but you know we're expecting to be higher than that this year, um, which is fantastic. You know, And so we have some great encryption with it. We have AES 256 for our encryption, which is higher than we've ever been. Um, and then all those kind of um, spikes in traffic we can handle now because we have um we don't have to kind of run our servers with a, a minimal um 
um, processing power, we can actually scale up those servers really quickly because we can quickly add resources to everything um, we have. And so if all of a sudden people start visiting your website, we can right. say, okay, let's add more resources, let's add more resources. And we can cope with that really easily and we don't have to, um, you know, do too much uh, playing around with it. So it, it's just very, very scalable um, and it just works so much better. Yeah, and it's also very, uh, we're able to kind of push it out regionally. So obviously the Cloudflare mm -hmm. piece creates these virtual versions of your site around the world. But in the end, I mean, with the different regional sites, it's, it's, it's not being hosted out of one location in one place. It's actually five different regional locations around the world mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and those pieces. Yeah. And the other piece that we've not really mentioned is we do have, um, we use Cloudflare uh, and mm -hmm. Cloudflare are a fantastic company. They, when they're moving data, they're actually using um, a tunnel, a VPN tunnel, um, so that even if the traffic is getting moved across the internet is actually in their secure platform. So you've got this layer of Google, but you've also then got this secondary layer of Cloudflare and, and they're doing our DDoS mitigation as well. So those um, 4 million attacks that we saw, most of those were stopped before they even got to our servers right. through Cloudflare. So it, it really is it's just a great service. Um, and with the CDN, we're just making sure whatever country people are visiting your site from, they are getting the quickest service that they can. So uh, definitely yep. something to look look for in a provider, make sure they have a CDN um, and, and then you'll have good good speeds. You know, and I think with COVID, we, we saw a massive uptick in, in website traffic. I mean, we passed the one, uh, 1 billion point this year uh, and, and we had some very specific events that were were you know when you talked about spikes i mean when i when i think of one specifically was the saturday virtual graduation at western academy beijing which was a massive uptick in traffic to a single page when they ran their virtual graduation online uh and and you know and and it was a very well coordinated effort uh and and you know, it's one of those things that that we're able to handle and work with you and and, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I, go ahead. I was going to say, and I, and I will say, I, I was talking to somebody uh, on Monday um, this week, and they said, you know, we had a virtual graduation, and so many people liked it. Uh, we weren't going to do it again. It was just going to be a one-off for this year, but so many people liked it and were able to pass it to their grandmothers and, and grandfathers and things like that. Yeah. They said, we've been asked to do it again, but this time we've got to add the eighth grade instead of the, just the ninth grade. So, you know, we're seeing things like that, that we'd never even um, thought that we'd need. All of a sudden there are these great ideas and people are using mm -hmm. them and they're benefiting from them. So, you know, it's those kind of things that, that, that can be positive um, from this last year, uh, even though lots of things have changed. Yeah, I mean, one of the other things that I've heard, especially from international schools, is the idea of the virtual tour, virtual open houses, because in the end, a lot of the families are expat families that, you know, one family may be moving in from Hong Kong, another one's moving in from Rio, three are moving in from London, and, and they can't come to a physical open day. And, and so how do you host them? How do you host an admissions event? And all these other pieces that, that really, I think schools have done just this amazing job of being able to pivot. When we think about, you know, for, for us here, everything shut down on the 13th of March. Well, we're two weeks away from that anniversary. And, and I think it's an amazing thing that the way schools were able in, in a matter of days um, at most weeks, were able to completely go from a bricks and mortar experience to a completely online experience. And, and I think the schools that did that the best are also the schools who are um, not suffering the types of enrollment losses that some of the other schools have. So this is the part where Rob and I, we have 10 minutes. So we actually nailed that. We said we we're going to do 10 minutes of questions at the end. I just looked at my watch. Wow. Perfect. So first I want to do want to say, you know, it, it's always one of those things where you either don't know exactly how you want to frame the question. 
you walk away from here and, and say, wow, I, I just thought of this. I wish I would have asked them. Or you're talking to a colleague and they ask you something and say, well, I didn't really think about that. Maybe I should ask them. There's our email information. You can email us directly. Um, LinkedIn is also a great way to get connected with us. Uh, I'm always trying to share out latest best practices when it comes to kind of design and, and those things. Rob hosts a, a tech talk with one of our colleagues. So he's always pushing out a lot of technical stuff. And so really between the two of us, I think it's kind of a, a good combination of, of all things digital uh, when it comes to that side. So we're, we're gonna open it up here. If there's anyone that has questions, uh, we'll go ahead and, 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 and wait for that. Uh, otherwise, um, yeah, Rob, I appreciate the yeah. time. Otherwise, thank you everybody, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. please, yeah, go ahead. So uh, I'm just wondering, like it's, um, let's say you're talking about best practices. Yep. Um, do you have a team available? Let's say uh, a school is trying to put out um, some information Yep. and you kind of look at it first and you're like, okay, I, you guys can do this a little better maybe with this because, mm -hmm. you know, marketing is not really, especially uh, a lot of administrative people right. come from being right. a teacher and stuff like that. And that's not really where we have our speciality you know what i mean sure. even teachers when we write out yeah our, no um, so yeah with it I'm, I'm happy you asked that because that's really and, and it's funny that that rob and i are together on this because because rob would definitely be much more on the technical side where i'm much more on the design consultative side and i think that's really one of the things that first of all i can offer now is that if you go to uh finalsite.com and you'll see a link there we, we will do a, uh, a full report card of your current setup um, okay. and, and, and those kinds of things. So a uh, website report card, mm -hmm. but that's the kind of work that we do and we specialize in. So we not only will help you maintain the website, we actually will help you design it. Uh, well, actually we will work on the design and the build and, and, and those things. But then after the launch of the site, we also partner with you on making sure that the content stays dynamic, stays up to date, stays fresh, all the, you know, all the different things that you have there. So, uh, and, and, you know, when you have a project manager during the setup, so the design and the build, a lot of their work is consultative and, and those things. And then after the launch of the site, we have a team where they're called the client success team. Um, and for those of you who were at Final Sight University um, or, the, or the 2019 uh, Vietnam Tech Conference, you actually, we had two of our uh, client services, our client success uh, managers who work with the schools in Asia there. Uh, and, and they're really your strategic guide. Uh, you know, we, had, we also, we have support based in Asia uh, as well. Uh, final site support, but really your client success manager, they're, they're there for the consultative side. They're there for the strategic side and, and will work with you and individually as a school. And, and the other thing I, I like to do, um, or I used to like to do when I was uh, back in the, the old communication days was um, beg, borrow and steal. Um, there yep. is, I posted in the chat there, a link to our packaging um, enhancement examples. Yep. So if you're looking for something specific, Go in there, see what they're doing, uh, and see if you can re recreate that. And if you do want a little bit more help on the marketing side, like if you say, I really want to plan, you know, something we can aim towards, um, we can definitely help you with that as well. We do have some marketing communication professionals that we um, basically can can hire out. I think what's uh, what's the advantage program hours? Is it thirty hours? We we. Yep. 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 And so we have the advantage full... program. Mm -hmm. Right. And do full consultative work. I've also put the link to our blog that has a ton of best practices, ideas, trends and, and all those things. And then also I'm putting our resources uh, link right there. And so with the resources, we have things like the website redesign playbook. We have social media uh, for schools, um, how, you know, LinkedIn for schools, Facebook for schools, Twitter for schools, Instagram for schools. We just did a blog post on TikTok's here to stay. How can your school take advantage? You know, those kinds of things. I mean, I, I would have, I would have laughed at you even, even I'm, 
and I'm kind of the, the social media presenter for Final Sight. And I'll be honest with you, two years ago, I think I would have laughed at you if you'd have told me TikTok was going to end up in schools. But so, uh, you know, in the end, I, I yeah. can't wait to see you dancing, Max. <laughs> yeah, that's that. You got that one there. Uh, yeah. So I, I think. Guys. OK. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I hope that so, answers your question. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead, JP. Um, yeah. yeah, so my other go question ahead. is looking at it from a teacher side, because I'm a teacher. Yep. Um, I understand how it all works for the administration, um, mm -hmm. and I understand how it, it benefits the administration. But as a teacher, administration likes to bring in new initiatives all the time, bring in new sure. programs all the time. And yep. then as teachers, we're just kind of told, figure it out. Yep. Um, <laughs> so. I don't know if you can answer this, but from a teacher's point of view, what would we have to do differently to, you know, really use Final Sight better? What, like, do we have to do anything at all um, in terms of how we upload things, put things together, or is it all taken care of by the administration? I, I can, I can, I can answer that yeah. to a certain degree. Um, certainly, what we see with a lot of our district schools in the United States is we've seen a move away from um, our platform and single platforms and saying you have to do it this way a lot of administrations have realized you know what if you like this platform use that platform and so right. if you are communicating and you're doing exactly what you need to do and your students are getting what they need all you really need to have is that information on the website so if if people can get to that information on the website and the communication circle is complete then mm -hmm. that should be all you need so um, if they're saying you have to use this I think my argument would be well you know I, I need to have these features how can you get me these features or this functionality you know and and i also think it's one of those things that uh from, from our end you know things like the admissions platform things like the uh recruitment things like uh hr you know those those are really administrative tasks and and a lot of that lives on the outward facing website part of that whereas the internal facing piece you know i, I think you have that that's where you may have some pieces, but I would say, how can you, uh, you know, in, in what ways, I mean, some of the ways that I've seen some amazing things is like, for example, the Ellington schools had an initiative where every club class, uh, team, teacher, coach, administrator, um, club head has their own Twitter account. That's only dedicated for school things. And they have a super rich, uh, social media environment. And, and so how can you do that? I mean, I, I don't, I can't tell you which platforms to use when it comes to social media. But what I can say is that I have seen some, some teachers individually as in initiatives really nail how to use social media um, for ways. I mean, I've seen some really creative ways that, that teachers have used Instagram. And, and I know that the shock immediately is, oh, but we can't put kids' pictures. I'm not talking about kids' pictures. I'm talking about the kids' work. You know, what, what, what are the drawings that they did? What is the, you know, the how, or, or the, the process to solve a math problem, the process, or a, you know, a quick 10 second video showing a lab piece. And, and I know we're up against time, but you know, I think what you can do as an individual teacher is to take a look at what are some of the parameters that I can work within and how can I corner some of the ideas that are on social media uh, and, and really use that to my advantage. Um, I think we're up against time and I do want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you to everyone there at Saigon South. Thank you to everyone uh, in, at all the teachers in Vietnam. Keep doing all the amazing work you're doing. Hang in there. And thanks, Rob. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Max and Rob, very much. If you have uh, additional questions for Max um, and or Rob, please post those on the Whova app. And they can check in there and be able to respond to your questions there on the Whova app. So let's please give a virtual or in the video round of applause for <laughs> Max and Rob. Stay warm there on the East Coast of America. And I think you guys are presenting again later, yeah? You have another one coming up? Uh, I do not, but right. I, I, think, I think one of our colleagues is going to be doing something. Okay. 